Welcome all to uh, this webinar, Medicine Matters Diabetes. And what we are going to discuss today is that we feel that it's time to reconsider the person with shortness of breath due to a new trial called Emperor Preserved. Uh, we will explain a little bit about heart failure. Uh, usually you hear about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, but we have got new treatments for those for, uh, with uh, preserved ejection fraction, and you will soon understand what I mean with that. I am accompanied today, and happy to be so, by Alice Cheng, who is Associate Professor uh, at the University of Toronto in Canada, and also uh, from the primary care sector, uh, the family doctor, Kevin Saunders, who works in Manitoba, also in Canada. My own name is Lars Friede, and I work as Senior Professor of Cardiology at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. And th this means that we are covering the subject from different angles. The primary care uh, angle, where many of these patients are seen, and from the endocrinological part with Alice Chang, and from the cardiovascular point, from my uh, point of view. And let's start here, Kevin. Uh, you have seen a patient. Can you talk a little bit about that? So I think, uh, Dr. Reden, to make this really applicable to family medicine, uh, I've pulled one of my own case studies. And it's, it's a very common conundrum for family doctors. Here's a very typical pa uh, patient that I think most of my colleagues out there could relate to. 68-year-old male with decreased energy and lethargy over the past year. And it's become much more pronounced as his weight has increased. He has some dyspnea with exertion, but no chest pain or any other classical cardiac symptoms. He admits that he's been very sedentary over the past several years, especially since he retired as a truck driver. Medical history includes diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. Medical exam finds a height of 66 inches or 167 centimeters, body weight 190 pounds or 86 kilograms. His body mass index is generous at 30.5, blood pressure 132 over 82, pulse 74. Chest sounds clear. Um, you're not hearing any crackles. Heart sounds are normal. Lab results look reasonable on first glance. Fasting sugar is 7.2 or 130. His A1C is 6.9%. GFR is normal at greater than 60. Albumin to creatinine ratio is normal. And his low density lipoprotein is reasonable at 1.8. So we have this very typical routine family practice patient. We often just attribute the increasing breathlessness to sedentary lifestyle and, and being out of shape. But we know as family physicians that there are patients who actually have uh, congestive heart failure mixed in that group. Hopefully you can explore with us exactly what is this patient, how do we identify these patients more clearly and manage them more effectively at a primary care level? So. This is perhaps a time for me to discuss a little bit about uh, how to diagnose uh, and uh, partly also handle people with heart failure. And to my help, I have very recently issued guidelines for the diagnosis and treatment of acute and chronic heart failure. These guidelines uh, were issued just a month ago about from the European Society of Cardiology, developed by a great number of people with great knowledge in the field. Uh, the guidelines are available on the web. You can go to the ESC homepage and download them. And they are also available as a pocket version, as an app. And uh, there is also a slide set. So those of you who want to rehearse a little bit after this webinar are welcome to go to the ESC and download what we have used for educational purposes in this setting. From these guidelines, uh, you can find this picture. It says, diagnosis algorithm for heart failure. And if you suspect heart failure, for instance, due to several risk factors, 
And the patient presented to you today had a couple of them. Diabetes was one, hypertension was another one, hyperlipidemia was another one. So he may very well have a myocardial involvement some way or other. Uh, symptoms and signs of heart failure, yeah, he had. He was dyspnoic on exercise. He was uh, uh, rather tired. And uh, that may have met several reasons, but uh, one of them could be heart failure. We didn't hear much about this electrocardiogram, but I think one of the first thing to do is to take an electrocardiogram and see whether you can find any hypertrophy, for instance, or any other aberration of that. One other sample that you can take, a blood sample, is to examine NT pro BMP. And if that is low, you can actually uh, say it's negative, and then heart failure is unlikely. But if it is uh, raised, heart failure is likely. And then the next step in the examination would be an echocardiogram. Now I happen to know that echocardiography is not immediately available, available for all people. For me as a cardiologist, perhaps quite easy, but for you as primary care physicians, perhaps less so. I wouldn't hesitate then to go on if I had a high NT pro BMP and a clinical suspicion about heart failure to test uh, if that could be the case. And we can discuss that later on. Another thing that you can read about and that we will discuss today is that uh, uh, we have usually talked about different types of heart failure. Uh, one type is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, hef ref. That means symptoms and signs of heart failure and the left ventricular ejection fraction measured by echocardiography of less than 40%. You have the mid-range ejection fraction, heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction, symptoms and signs as before, but a left ventricular ejection fraction of 41 to 49. And finally, what perhaps is most, most in focus today, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, then uh, the left ventricular ejection fraction exceeds 50%. <clears throat> but at the same time, there should be objective evidence of structural or functional abnormalities consistent with the presence of left ventricular diastolic function and uh, uh, in including natriuretic peptides that are increased. But we may also come to a conclusion later on today because of new evidence from uh, heart failure trials that it is perhaps not as important as before to distinguish between these types of ejection fractions. Uh, diagnostic tests uh, are all listed here as recommended by the ESC guidelines and all are class one, which is a very high class. It should be done actually. Uh, you have the NT pro BMP, you have the electrocardiogram that we discussed, echocardiography if you have it available, chest x-ray could be an alternative if you want to see if the heart is enlarged, and then some routine blood tests because they are searching for comorbidities. A full blood count, uh, dyspnea may due to anemia, urea, electrolytes, because uh, institutional therapy necessitates knowledge about electrolytes and kidney function, thyroid function, fasting glucose, HbA1c, blood lipids, and iron status, because many people with heart failure actually have an iron deficiency, and iron supplementation may actually be a thing that could help them to a certain extent. Very important is to search for the etiology of heart failure because heart failure as such is a syndrome. It depends on something and it's usually not treatable. You can help the patient, you can, uh, you can resolve symptoms, but in the long run, you cannot do much more than that. But if you have, for instance, a valvular heart disease or a hypertension or an arrhythmia behind the heart failure, that is perhaps sometimes possible to cure. And this is just a short list of possibilities. If you look at the guidelines, there are several other options as a background for heart failure and an illustration of which types of investigations can help you in identifying the back, background problem uh, causing the heart failure. Let us now for a moment consider how common is heart failure. And this is data taken out of the new European guidelines. The incidence in Europe in people of all ages 
uh, is three per 1,000 person years. In adults, more common, five per 1,000 person years. The prevalence in adults in pro proportion is, if you are less than 55 years, 1% of the population, about 70 years, about 10% of the population, indicating that with increasing age, this becomes a more and more common syndrome. Uh, in a registry run by the European Society of Cardiology across hospitals in, in Europe, HEF-REF, uh, reduced ejection fraction heart failure, 60%, mid-range, 24%, and preserved ejection fraction, 16%. The last figure, 16%, is probably an underestimation because the registry was made on hospital-based patients, essentially, and there you have more myocardial injury and reduced ejection fraction. So probably now when we start to know about better treatment for people with preserved ejection fraction, we will detect that they are probably more common than we believe. Finally, it is about the same proportion of females and males who have heart failure, about 50% each. These are dull numbers. You can translate them like this. Approximately 60 million or more patients worldwide have heart failure. A couple of years ago, heart failure was the underlying cause of almost 80,000 deaths in the United States. And approximately half of patients diagnosed with heart failure will die within five years. So it's a very serious thing to have. Heart failure is one of the leading causes of hospitalization and the number one cause in patients uh, above the age of 65. And readmission rate after hospitalization for heart failure are as high as 30% within about two or three months. Approximately 30% of patients die of those hospitalized within one year. Hospitalization is moreover expensive. So there is a really uh, something to be gained by keeping people out of hospital and uh, treat them in that respect. And a lot of money can be saved and used for good medical treatment, including pharmacology. The class one therapy, that is the best therapy for patients with heart failure with preserved, sorry, reduced ejection fraction, is a combination of drugs, ACE inhibitors or ARNI, beta blocker, mineral receptor antagonists, and then dapagliflozin and empagliflozin. Loop diuretics should only be used for symptomatic release if there is a fluid retention. And then we can skip the rest of this slide, but uh, you can find this and more of the similar kind in the guidelines if you're interested. The traditional four pillars then for treatment of heart failure reduced the left ventricular ejection fraction are ARNIs that are superior to ACE inhibitors, ACE inhibitors or ARBs, if you don't have access to ARNIs or the patient cannot take it, mineral receptor antagonists and beta blockers. And the question is, what about pa patients with preserved ejection fraction, which is the focus of a, la a large part of this particular webinar? Thank you, Dr. Eden. So if I understand you, going back to my case, the 68-year-old diabetic male, prevalence of heart failure would be approaching 10%, uh, certainly a significant number. And the recommended initial approach, understanding that at least here in Canada, it's taking me six to 12 months to get an echo, uh, at least to start with a chest X-ray, a cardiogram, and a pro BNP blood test um, to help start more accurately diagnosing this patient would be your starting recommendation. Absolutely. And um, I have two parts of, of answer to the question. First of all, I do not really think that one year or more to wait for an echocardiogram is appropriate nowadays. So one thing you have to do is to fight for better availability of echoes. And uh, there are small and very easy to use echocardiograph uh, machines. So why don't you uh, teach yourself to use them? Uh, that's an option. But for the time being, and considering your year of waiting, I would uh, actually go for the case history, then do an uh, uh, electrocardiogram and follow up with an NT-proof BMP. Uh, if, uh, if that was positive, 
I would uh, actually uh, believe that the patient has heart failure and start to treat because the prognosis is bad, even for preserved ejection fraction and mid-range. And why should the patient wait for a potential life-saving therapy for a long time? And then you can always ask for the echocardiogram and see if you were okay with that later on. Lars, I, I wanted to comment on what you said about uh, uh, trying to perhaps do echoes on our own. And, and I, you know, Kevin chuckled there. And I have to admit, I was chuckling a bit myself thinking that that, that will be the day when endocrinologists start doing echoes in the office. Although I, I think what you say is valid, uh, but that would be a, yet a whole other piece of learning that we would all then have to do. I want to make a comment here. Uh, I institute glucose lowering drugs without being an endocrinologist. I have a education in internal medicine. And to make a very simple echo, not the sophisticated that you need to, to uh, decide about valve replacement and, and uh, sophisticated issues, but to make a very simple investigation is not that difficult. And if you have many patients of a certain kind and you have an enormous waiting list, then it may perhaps be worthwhile thinking about competing with a specialist that cannot deliver, they will be more keen to deliver when you try to step into their backyard. That's good advice there. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. I love what you said about, about being able or to have the clinical suspicion in our minds and then don't allow delays in investigations to stop people from getting therapies that could potentially be helpful. So earlier you had talked about the traditional pillars for management of HEFREF and, and in what you showed for the updated ESC guidelines, there was also inclusion, I noticed, of the SGLT2 inhibitor. So let me just very quickly show people the evidence that allowed SGLT2 inhibitors to enter the HEFREF space, and then we'll focus on the newer data in the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction space. So there are two main trials of SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure. There is DAPA-HF, which of course looked at dapagliflozin, 10 milligrams a day, in a population with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, only 42% of whom had type 2 diabetes. And they were able to demonstrate in a short period of time significant reductions in, in heart outcomes, um, very relevant outcomes, not just in terms of patient morbidity, but also mortality, but also a, a cost to the system, as Lars alluded to earlier, in terms of the costs associated with hospitalization. So these are the data for dapagliflozin. And then there are very similar data for empagliflozin in the emperor-reduced emperor study, looking at HEF-REF patients, again, about 50% with diabetes, but all of whom had heart failure with reduced ejection fraction showing significant reductions in hard endpoints, again, in a relatively short period of time. So not surprisingly, SGLT2 inhibitors have been added to the pillars of management in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And what I'm showing you here is coming from the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, but clearly the European Society for Cardiology has very similar recommendations now. And that is because of course, the consistency of the data in HEF-REF. The, the question, though, is what about HEF-PEF and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, although being common in my office and common in Kevin's office, although probably underrecognized, uh, we never really had a lot of things to offer. And, and it wasn't for a lack of trying in that there have been a number of studies looking at different therapies in HEF-PEF. And as you can see here, not shown to be beneficial in terms of heart outcomes. But thankfully, that has all changed as of towards the end of August of 2021, when we saw the results of the Emperor Preserve study, which is the first time that any pharmacotherapy has been shown definitively to have outcome reduction in a HEF-PEF population. So this was a randomized control trial, as you would expect with large cardiovascular outcome trials. And the patients who were included were those with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction defined as having an LV ejection fraction greater than 40%, along with an elevated uh, NT-pro-BNP. 
Now, what was not needed to get into the study was diabetes. So about 50% of the patients happened to also have diabetes, but about 50% did not. So this was definitely a heart failure study of HEF-PEF, and patients were randomized to receive empagliflozin 10 milligrams or placebo, and then followed forward looking for classic heart failure study type of endpoints. And I think what was very impressive was the 21% relative risk reduction in the hard primary endpoint of first adjudicated cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure, which translated into a number needed to treat of only 31 over a median follow-up of only about 26 months. So it was not something that took years and years and years to show benefit, but actually was able to show benefit in a fairly short period of time. And this was also true of the secondary endpoint looking at total hospitalization for heart failure with a 27% relative risk reduction and, and fairly early separations of the groups suggesting that the benefits can be manifested quite quickly when we institute therapy. Going back to Lars's point earlier, I think about how we shouldn't be waiting just because it takes forever to get a certain test. If the suspicion is there, perhaps we should just go ahead and institute therapy while waiting for those investigations to occur. And then of course, the question that often comes up is, was there a difference then depending on the ejection fraction, was there a difference for diabetes or no diabetes? And when you look at the different LV ejection fractions at baseline, uh, there was no statistical heterogeneity amongst the groups. And when you look at those with or without diabetes, it really did not matter. So although SGLT2 inhibitors may have been born in the diabetes world, uh, they've certainly grown up and have made friends in other therapeutic areas. And now diabetes is just one of the things that they might treat, but I suspect that their roles have really expanded beyond uh, diabetes quite significantly. And, and then the other interesting endpoint that was looked at in Emperor Preserved uh, was the change in EGFR slope. Because I, as I said, SGLT2 inhibitors have grown past diabetes. Uh, they've grown into the cardiac space and heart failure, but they've also grown into the kidney space. So one of the endpoints that was looked at was change in the slope of the EGFR, knowing that the natural history is for EGFR to slowly decline over time. But interestingly, those who were on empagliflozin had a slower decline over time, which ultimately then would be beneficial in terms of renal endpoints for this population. So I think it's exciting in that now there actually is a therapy shown to be beneficial for heart endpoints in this hef pef population, a population where previously there was really nothing to offer for outcomes, uh, only symptomatic type treatment, and that this benefit was really there uh, in diabetes, but also outside of diabetes. So if we summarize Emperor Preserved, a significant reduction in the primary endpoint of adjudicated cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure, significant reduction in the key secondary of total heart failure hospitalization, as well as the key secondary endpoint of EGFR slope decline. So impressive results and, and ones that we really should be applying uh, to our patient population. We've had SGLT2 inhibitors for some time now, uh, but I think they're, they're, there's still room for improvement, shall we say, in terms of utilization of this class of drugs, uh, not just in diabetes, but also now in heart failure, as well as in the chronic kidney disease space. So let, let me give you a few sort of tips and tricks that, that probably apply the most, frankly, to the diabetes population. And if you're using these drugs outside of diabetes, a lot of what I have to say may not even need to apply. So it's frankly easier. But in the diabetes space, it's always worthwhile when you initiate to explain to the patient that you're starting for outcome reduction slash organ protection, as opposed to just glucose, because we know that the glucose efficacy of these drugs are really limited to EGFRs above 45, but yet the cardiorenal protection extends below that. So that's why I actually no longer introduce these drugs purely as sugar drugs, but actually these are for your organs. So as long as you have the organs, please continue to take uh, this medication. I explained that it, it lets you uh, pee out sugar and therefore it's important to drink enough water so you stay hydrated. Now that advice may change in the heart failure space and I'll let Lars speak to that shortly. 
uh, making sure that there's proper genital hygiene because there's sugar now in the urine and wanting to make sure that a yeast infection doesn't occur. Hence the t-shirt on the right about pee, rinse, wipe, which I think is a good motto for people to be thinking of. And then I think it's important, especially if someone has diabetes, just to let the other people on the team know. So in primary care, let their diabetes team know, let the cardiology team know, cardiology, let the other teams know. As long as we are all aware, I think that's the key. And then in acute illness uh, or in the perioperative setting, we do tell people to stop these medicines temporarily uh, just to avoid further dehydration. Although over time, we may very well change that advice. And then finally, generally speaking, we do not use liberally in type one diabetes, although depending on where you work, it, some of these drugs are indicated in type one diabetes, but to be used very cautiously in type one because of that risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. And then another common question I get is, okay, but if they're on other diabetes drugs, if I'm, I'm gonna add this for organ protection, what do I need to think about? And to keep it simple, you only need to worry about this if the GFR is over 45. Because if the GFR is below 45, it's not going to touch the sugar anyway. So no need to worry about hypoglycemia. But if it is above 45, then the only question is, are they on insulin or sulfonylurea? And if they're not, well, then you're fine. Go ahead and add it because you're not going to cause hypo because it's the insulin or the SU that can cause hypo. If they are on insulin or SU, then personally, I would say, take a look at their A1C. And if their A1C is above 8% on the right-hand side, then go ahead and add it. They've got room. Counsel about what hypo feels like, but you probably don't have to worry too much about it. If their A1C is below 8%, then that's where maybe reducing the saphonyurea um, may be appropriate or stopping it. And then in the case of insulin, if you're not comfortable with the insulin adjustments, you may want to reach out to the diabetes team. You may do slight insulin reductions, but one piece of advice is not to stop people's insulin when initiating an SGLT2. And if unsure, just reach out to the diabetes team. But those would be sort of my practical tips, I guess, uh, if you are in fact wanting to add these drugs in someone who lives with diabetes. Phenomenal data. And as a family doc who treats everything from A to Z, like my colleagues out there in primary care, uh, I really think that with this emperor preserved data, I actually had a sense of relief because we knew what to do with reduced ejection fraction patients. Now we have something that works for preserved ejection fraction patients. And with the advent of the pro BNP blood test, I don't have to wait any one year to engage these patients. In my simple mind, I can do a simple blood test for patients that I'm suspicion on, suspicious of, and engage treatment because the treatment works regardless of what the echocardiogram is going to show me. Am I correct in that thinking? It seems like the case from my perspective, but Lars, what, what, what do you think about what Kevin just said? In principle, I think you are uh, more right than wrong. Uh, the, the problem, uh, to take that first, is that you should, even if you don't have the echo, try to get as close to a diagnosis. Why does the patient has heart failure? Because that is important for, for treatment besides symptomatic treatment of the heart failure as a syndrome. And then you need the electrocardiogram, you need, you need your case history, you need blood pressure, uh, you need glucose uh, uh, estimates, and, and you need kidney function to know about that. So don't really think that you can just avoid everything now because of, of, of the simplicity that we have talked about. Right, uh, So, to, because it seems to me that when we have uh, a lot of people who have uh, hypertension, who have uh, uh, hyperlipidemia, many other things, they, they will get a number of, of, the, uh, of the drugs that are fundamental even for heart failure treatment with uh, reduced or even preserved ejection fraction, uh, like beta blockers, perhaps to a certain extent, but at least ACE inhibitors or, or uh, ARBs for their blood pressure. And, and uh, then you can add the SGLT2 inhibitor. And it seems to me, shown by uh, Alice in one of her slides, that as, as soon as the patient has uh, ejection fraction 
uh, which is at least below 60 uh, percent, then it doesn't matter much because all these patients are actually well treated with SGLT2 inhibitors. The beauty of the SGLT2 inhibitors is that it's only one dose, empagliflozin 10 milligram, dapagliflozin also a standard dose, and even the others. So it's easy to do it. And if you take the, the precaution outlined by Alice now, then you know that it's a pretty safe treatment. It's not difficult at all to institute. A, a very common question to ask cardiologists is when should you start it? You should start it as soon as possible because it act, actually has a very rapid onset of action. And therefore, why, why should you deprive the patient of a very uh, rapidly onsetting cure? Uh, relief uh, if you can. So it's much easier now when we have both the emperor preserved and emperor reduced going in the same direction. So if, if I may ask a question then of you, Lars, uh, the, back to the point I made about drinking enough fluids. I, I know for as, as endocrinologists and, and in the primary care space, we've been playing with these drugs for years now and gotten quite comfortable with them. And, and in a hyperglycemic individual, having adequate hydration is important because that's they're sort of flushing out the sugar, if you will. But now that we're using these outside of diabetes and more importantly, using them in a heart failure patient, what would be more appropriate advice then in terms of hydration if we're gonna add an SGLT2 inhibitor? First of all, if, if, if we are about to institute an SGLT2 inhibitor, it may be very wise if the patient is on furosemide or something like that, to, to take it out for the time being, because there may be an increased diuresis by the SGLT2 inhibitor. And then ask the patient to follow the body weight. And if that, that goes up inappropriately, it may depend on fluid accumulation, and then you can use the diuretic again. Uh, I don't think we should advocate people with heart failure to drink uh, awful amounts, lots of, of fluid, because they, they are uh, actually somewhat, uh, they, they, they don't stand that in the same sense, and in particular if they don't have normal kidney function. An interesting thing uh, about the impact of SGLT2 inhibitors on people with uh, heart failure preserved ejection fraction is that some people start to think that perhaps some of the um, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is not primarily a heart problem. It's a kidney problem. The kidneys start to fail and, and just EGFR is not enough, but albuminuria and some other measures of kidney function or dysfunction may indicate that it's onsetting. And then you get uh, sodium and water retention. And the sodium and water retention uh, increases the load on the heart and also causes interstitial fluid retention. And uh, normal diuretics does not really drain interstitial fluids as much as the SGLT2 inhibitors. And, and uh, turning them to people with diabetes, I think that almost every patient, but correct me if I'm wrong, Alice, they do have a surplus of sodium and water on board. So it's natural that if you can get rid of that, they feel better. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. But, but I, I like that piece of advice about the, maybe in a heart failure patient, perhaps not uh, emphasizing the increased fluid drinking. I think that's very valuable. Old times, we, when we didn't have efficient diuretics, then we restricted fluid intake. That was cruel treatment because th these patients are usually rather thirsty. But it seems that SGLT2 inhibitions and the way it acts uh, is it, easy to take for the patient without problem. Uh, the, the, the problem you emphasized are, are the most common. And uh, perhaps a little bit of warning, uh, you, you had it. If the patient is demanding insulin, and if you take that away, you may end up in a uh, problem with, with uh, uh, because insulin has many effects, not only glucose reducing. So as we're about to close, may I ask each of my learned colleagues for one key pearl for my family practice colleagues, primary care practitioners out there across Europe and North America? 
Perhaps I, I'll start and Lars, I'll, I'll let you uh, give the perhaps most important pearl. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give my, my pearl or my two cents. I, I think it's to be aware of that patient with shortness of breath and just consider whether heart failure is on that differential diagnosis and to avoid the reflexive, and I'm guilty of this, the reflexive assumption that this is just uh, one, just exercise more, just get in shape, uh, you'll be fine, um, or just attributing it to obesity. I think that's something that uh, we tend to reflexively do, uh, but to perhaps think a bit broader. Presumably, uh, patients with dyspnea and tiredness uh, do have some sort of heart problem more often than we have considered before. On the other hand, when you don't have uh, uh, e efficient therapy, then you tend not to uh, want to diagnose things that you cannot do anything about. And then an explanation that you are old or that you are a little bit less uh, physically fit than you should be and so forth is perhaps comforting to the patient. But today, when there is sufficient therapy available, which is easy to institute, even if you are a cardiologist or a primary care physician, you don't have to be an endocrinologist to do it. Then it's much more important to carefully evaluate why does the patient feel tired? Why is it dyspnoic? And what can I do about it? And then at least start with a simple blood test, NT proof BMP and, and uh, look in, in, the, in the history of the patient, is there anything that could have interfered with a myocardial function like hypertension during a long time, diabetes, coronary artery disease or whatsoever. So in principle, I think we should be more open-minded now than we used to be uh, regarding this. Uh, should end this webinar, what did we actually tell you? We thought, uh, that we told you and hope that we did, that there is new therapy for patients with heart failure with what we call preserved ejection fraction. And uh, that is SGLT2 inhibition. And uh, nowadays, besides ARNI, besides uh, mineral receptor antagonist, and besides beta blockers, this SGLT2 inhibitor comes in as roaring lion in the heart failure th treatment. There is no reason to delay the institution of such drug. Uh, that, um, you have to look at heart, uh, kidney function. Uh, people with very low kidney function shouldn't have these drugs, at least at the moment. And you should look at blood pressure regulation and so on, and keep an eye on that and fluid regulation, as we had said. But in principle, it's quite simple. And it works over a whole range of ejection fractions. So this is a simple drawing about drugs, uh, which you can use for hef ref, but you can use about the same drugs for hef pef nowadays. And the most efficient of them all in hef pef preserved ejection fraction, these are the SGLT2 inhibitors. But do not forget that people with heart failure have many other concomitant diseases and problems. And sometimes they need anticoagulants, sometimes they need antiarrhythmics, sometimes they need diuretics for symptomatic relief, sometimes they have a high heart rate. If Abradine is, uh, if they are in sinus risk, then an option, and so forth. So with a new drug, you have good new options, and don't forget the old ones. That is our message today. Good luck with the future with you and your patients with. Uh, heart failure due to preserved ejection fraction. And hopefully we have been, helped you a little bit on this route. Thank you all for listening.